Okay. Um, so uh, my talk is going to be about mo human motion prediction for, for social navigation. Um, also, uh, my position is assistant professor at Skoltech, and let me briefly introduce a little about, about us, about Skoltech. So it's a new university that was founded in 2012 in collaboration with MIT. The general purpose is to be in the international arena for uh, publications and scientific contributions. And well, here you can see a picture of our new campus. It's still not fully operative now, but it uh, looks good. So, so far we've been doing classes and other things. And well, it's located in Moscow. Okay, so let me define what my problem is because I think um, motion prediction highly is highly conditioned by what is the task that uh, you want to do, right? So there's many tasks here that you could be doing with uh, prediction. So uh, you have already them. Uh, in my case, it's gonna be on robot navigation, right? So you can uh, imagine this kind of urban environment. There's a structure, there's dynamic agents. In this case, dynamic agents are the pedestrians. And well, the task is basically how to get from whatever position uh, in this uh, in this environment as uh, well safely enough let's say because that's still under discussion and 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 successfully okay so uh, I'm gonna now discuss how we because we really need to understand uh, motion prediction to achieve this task and that's basically the purpose of today's topic uh, let me first talk about intentionality prediction or intent prediction I think this is gonna be a common topic for other talks today but let me present it the following way, right? So we have uh, potentially any kind of environment. Here we have a pedestrian and the task is, uh, well, the general task is motion prediction, right? So in this case, we would like to know what is the future trajectory that this uh, person in particular is gonna take. And what in in intentionality gives us is we can break down the problem, right? The, this urban setting could be translated as just a set of destinations or goals. In this case, you can see some of them, they are made up in this picture, but uh, some of them correspond to entrances, crossings, doors, etc. right? So basically they are salient points. And then the motion prediction uh, becomes just predicting these goals, right? So this is half of the prediction problem, right? And what is the advantage of intent, right? So you will see this in other tasks as well, but in our case, when we were working on this, uh, basically we wanted to reduce the complexity on prediction. And also uh, this helped us on the interpre interpretability, right, on prediction that we were seeing. So back in the day, we were working on this, uh, this idea, how to uh, propose uh, basically a classifier that tells us which is the most likely destination, right? That's, that's the same as intent prediction. In this case, we tried out many different features. Uh, a heading was the one that was stronger. These days, probably this kind of approach would be a little outdated and well, basically you will be combining all features in a learning based approach. But what's important here is that uh, we had in mind like a fast um, classifier of these um, destinations. And for that purpose, I think this uh, Bayesian human intention, intentionality prediction work very well. So we just have a sequence of headings and then um, we just uh, um, classify which is the most likely one, right? Just by accumulating uh, different heading observations. The second part for motion prediction is one um, model based. In this case, uh, we were using the social force model. Uh, this model was proposed long time ago, right? By uh, neuroscientists and it's a very popular model. It's also very attractive and very simple, I would say, and that's part maybe of its beauty. It treats pedestrians as two dynamical particles and then there are like attractors and other uh, interaction forces, but at the end, um, each of them superpose and the paths generated depend on these interactions. So for instance, in this example, there's gonna be some destinations in this environment as we have described. Uh, we will be calculating them by our intentionality prediction and then how to calculate the path. Well, it depends on which um, other agents are in this scene, right? So each of them is gonna exert like some force and this is gonna create like a sort of different paths. 
I have to say that initially we start working with this, not as a prediction tool, but more like a navigation tool, right? So for simple, simple environments, not very complex when there's not a lot of uh, pedestrians or other objects, uh, works very well for robot navigation. This is also part of our contribution. It's not the same parameters for robot, right? So we were very interested in studying this simple model, what happens when you apply this to robots. And basically, well, it could be used for navigation and robot companion, but as I say, in simple environments, when things get a little more complicated, there's uh, limitations, right, in this kind of approach. But still, uh, it's very useful. I'm gonna say now later, like some advantages also of these kind of approaches. So we mix together the uh, two parts, the intentionality prediction and this concatenation of social force model. So you can think this as a transition function that we um, calculate sequentially. And then what we generate is just a trajectory, right? Uh, here, well, we are also depicting covariances, but uh, I think I will not discuss on them. Uh, and you can also think about this as a motion prediction network, right? So each layer, it's gonna be a transition function and basically we are just on grabbing this trajectory generation. Now, uh, what happens when there's multiple uh, agents in the scene? So thanks to this uh, model, we can calculate what is the uh, changes in this trajectory prediction due to other pedestrians, right? So in this case, uh, we don't calculate things in depth. We calculate them uh, each uh, next pedestrian uh, position like at the same time. And that way we can capture interactions, right? So this is gonna be a uh, very interesting feature that, um, well, we'll see later how it uh, affects uh, planning. Another important takeoff from here was uh, the importance of intentionality. Here, this blue line uh, is what happens when we try to predict uh, motion without any sense of, uh, of intent, right? So we see that it rapidly degradates. There's, it's not possible just to estimate current state of any agent without goals, without intent, and have an accurate prediction over long-term horizons. So the accuracy here, lower means worse, uh, gets bad, and basically here we were just including intent with different kind of combinations. Still, uh, the paths generated by the SFM are not that accurate, right? Sometimes there are some artifacts, especially close to local minima and other um, kind of configurations, but it provides a very reliable cost function, right? So this is what we're interested in. This uh, talk, mostly I'm using prediction as a way to evaluate trajectories. So following with this idea, what we um, kept investigating is, okay, we have this um, um, prediction network, right? We have these trajectories that we can calculate um, like uh, overall, what is gonna be the state of the system, right? Position of the agents. So what we are gonna be doing now is we are gonna incorporate the robot and, we, and then uh, use the same uh, kind of architecture to uh, combine planning and, and prediction. So in this case, uh, to the prediction scheme shown before, um, we are just adding a robot. And then at each, uh, and, and here I'm just using a simple extend function just to get to this destination. So this will correspond to a single branch of the uh, planning. But what's interesting here is that just because there's a robot, now the uh, prediction actually changes slightly, right? And we are very interested in this slight and subtle um, variations on the prediction because actually this is giving us a very um, strong signal, right? On the, uh, on the evaluation for this uh, particular path, right? So this will be for a single branch and then we keep doing this. We have multiple branches and that's uh, could calculate like a good robot plan. Um, so like for instance here, um, these blue lines here center at the robot, each of them is a plan. And then what we see here, these uh, cylinders is the position of the pedestrian with respect to each of the plans, right? So uh, almost it's imperceptible, but they change, especially when you are very close and, and that's a way for us to evaluate the quality of the path. Um, simplifying a lot, we just take the best path, depending on how much we are affecting the um, let's say overall prediction and how much we are approaching the goal. And that's the path that we were selecting. But it's interesting because prediction is affecting navigation and navigation also, it's also affecting prediction. So this is, I think, a non-separable pro uh, process. 
And maybe for this task, or maybe for other tasks that are not including uh, navigation, I think um, this is like the most accurate way of, of approaching the problem. If it's possible, the only downside is that this process is expensive, right? So you need to calculate a lot of things, especially for each path. And that took us to the next steps, right? That we were following. And it's, it's uh, the idea is also very simple, right? Uh, we were very interested in executing things in real time. So that means that our computational budget was limited. We cannot really explore the state space and do paths for all possible, um, um, well, for all possibilities. Instead, uh, what we were doing is we just propose a small set of policies, and this is just for illustration, right, to understand what these policies are. In this case, we have Go Solo. This is just the SFM policy trying to reach a destination. A very trivial policy, but very useful stop. It tries to do, it, all it does, it's just stopping and then following agents, right? Um, again, this is just for illustration. Policies could be discussed here, where is a policy, if it's handcrafted, if it's learned, if there's like, I don't know, like continuous set of parameters. Subtle uh, variations on the prediction. Yes, sorry, variations where? Okay, I didn't get that question, so I'm just gonna keep uh, going. Now, what do we do? Uh, I was talking before about the uh, prediction network. So this is an example on the left, you see more like a network. In this case, we have a transition function. Here, we could be using anything. We were using SFM, but here, any other kind of model or learn-based approach could be used. And then on the right is the result of, of this um, sequence, right, of transition functions. So what we do with this approach is we have a policy that is just trying to do a very simple thing. And then we have a very complicated environment that is doing like more complex things. But it, still, uh, we are capturing these interactions, right? We know what's the effect of executing that policy. And we know how the system evolves over time, right? So it's basically each of these transitions. There's also um, some stochasticity on the input. We are not, we cannot be 100% certain on the uh, state uh, estimations, right? So that's why we are representing this as a distribution. And then the, the problem was just, uh, we were sampling over this um, state estimation of the other agents. We were forward propagating, and then we were selecting which was the most, uh, uh, the, the minimum cost uh, policy, right? So uh, the interesting thing is that just by combining these simple policies, some intelligent behavior emerges. Uh, it's also, um, uh, with, with this approach, what we are cho choosing is which policy to execute, but uh, the policy, once it's chosen, it's running like at full speed, right? So it could depend on the frame rate of the sensor or whatever, right? So these two processes are kind of independent, independent or hierarchical, right? So that gives like a very crisp and fast response to any other changes. And then by changing policies, we can see like this um, behavior. Okay, um, so because we had a limited policy, a uh, limited time budget, calculation budget, I mean, uh, we were sometimes enforcing like a limitation on this and we overcome that limitation by, by the following approach. So sometimes with samples, we were not able to predict height cost outcomes. What is a height cost outcome? It could be a collision, it could be any other dangerous situation. Right, it's just because of the nature uh, of the algorithm, that right? Is. Sampling is limited. So what we do instead, uh, we use back propagation to do it gradient ascent. So uh, the same uh, prediction network as we were discussing before with the same parameters, uh, we are forward propagating. But this is not, this is just the first step. The second step is uh, we use those gradients to look for close by and likely uh, events to happen. And likely means that we are leveraging here probabilities. It's not a worst outcome algorithm, but we are looking for high cost outcomes. And why is that? Because these high, um, high cost outcomes are very spiky. Uh, they are usually like, uh, this is not a small function that uh, you can find easily, right? Sometimes small perturbations on the initial conditions that is maybe a faster velocity on one of the agents or a different heading or maybe a different goal these little changes uh, become like high cost in, uh, and as I said, even dangerous situations. So I think this is 
better illustrated with this example. On the left, you see what happens with random sampling. It's not always happening this way, but in this particular experiment where we knew that uh, prediction had like some issues and the algorithm was like maybe too overconfident of yes, sure, I can go through these two persons moving. Uh, then some results sometimes were not as good as uh, we would like. So it's definitely safety was compromised. Well, you can see on the right, uh, we are doing this other technique of gradient ascent. We are looking for height cost outcomes. And that way helped us uh, to select like uh, better policies. So let's say help us to select like better plans. Okay, so just as a conclusion, I would say that on the first part, intentionality proves prediction. Um, well, this is a common thing. Um, but we've been working with this idea for quite some time, and I'm sure that there's other uh, directions here that other labs are taking. Then uh, we are dividing this motion trajectory into uh, just a sequence of uh, transition functions. Here, this approach is flexible. We start talking about the SFM, but literally you could be using any other model you want, any other uh, data-driven approach, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you ungrab the trajectory generation, right? So that way you have control on the prediction. And then we combine this with planning, right? So we know that these two things are very entangled. One depends on the other and vice versa. It's not a sequence. You cannot really predict and then plan, right? So there uh, has to be like some iterations over it. And then mainly uh, what we are interested is not really on having like super accurate uh, motion prediction, but I think um, prediction in this case, it's a very valuable tool to evaluate trajectories, right? Or to evaluate tools, that depends. Uh, also, if we are looking for efficiency, well, I think policies can give like very good results, surprisingly good results, right, for such a simple thing. And as I said, here, uh, you can go as complicated as you want, maybe having like um, here many layers on the policies. It's not that, um, uh, well, it could give like more complexity, more richness on the function approximator. But, um, well, there's basically trade-offs here and uh, I don't know, maybe efficiency, it's an issue for you and you cannot go that deep. And I think one of also the very uh, interesting things that we found out is that risk should constantly be ensured. So why is that? Uh, just with this adversarial example that I showed, um, it's not that we were not, I mean, the initial assumption is that we have noise, we have uncertainty, even policies are imperfect, right? Because there's imbalances in data, because there's limitations on the uh, model, it doesn't matter. The fact is that this is not 100% certain. Right, so a way to ensure uh, safety, I think it could be like uh, just adversarial optimization and looking for this height uh, cost outcomes or, or, or potentially dangerous things. And, and this I think could be applied not just to social navigations, but to any other kind of environment that, well, uses prediction as its main tool. Okay, thanks for listening. I think that was all I had. Maybe I can take some questions now. Yeah, thank you, Gonzalo, for the wonderful talk. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? All right, then maybe, um, oh, there is one actually. Uh, there is a question in the chat. How are you defining safety during the training? Can you elaborate on that? Um, yes. So we are not really defining safety here. Uh, what we are defining is two different cost functions. One is achieving a goal and the other is what we call blame. And blame is this inconvenience in the trajectory, right? So you can imagine that uh, if you slightly change what the prediction should be without a robot and you put a robot and this changes by a lot, uh, that's what we mean by safety. And then you have hard safety, which are just collisions, right? So this is just checking distances. But I think the first one is a little, softer and more useful because a hard collision it's something that you cannot really work on it's not differentiable you know you have a lot of problems so i would say that uh this blame how much you are perturbing the the, the prediction uh, there is a question oh i'm reading the question so it's asking if i treat robots and people with the same sfm no 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 uh the point of the extended social force model was uh, because we observed that they were not exactly the same. So we obtained like some other parameters and then we were using different set of parameters for this interaction, person to person and person to robot.
Nice. And uh, there is a question from my side. Um, in the social force model, how do you treat the obstacles and whether you decide to treat the obstacles or you assume an obstacle free environment? Mm, we treat the obstacles by, let's say, dividing uh, them into a set of um, circles, if you want, or spheres, right? So every, every obstacle becomes decomposed like this set of, uh, and then how to place them, it's a little tricky. But I would say that it's a sequence of uh, point obstacles, right, that make the effect. There's a lot of problems with um, this kind of approach. But as I said, I think uh, it's not that SFM is the only thing. Actually, I'm looking forward <laughs> just to improve this kind of model. So if you could be using like any other model, any other data-driven approach, I think you could overcome some of these limitations. Mm -hmm.